behalf of Sankalp Global Summit and IntelliCap, I welcome you all to Sankalp Virtual 2020 and this exciting session today we have planned for you, uh, Barriers to Adoption of Digital Financial Services. We are delighted to have you all join us today, especially in this new format, for starting a very exciting week with us and a very exciting session ahead. Uh, a few housekeeping rules uh, on the site before I hand it over to our partners. Uh, I request all audience members to keep yourselves on mute and your video off while the panel is on. Uh, please feel free to use the chat to share suggestions, questions. We'll take questions at the end and then you can also unmute and ask your questions, but uh, I'll leave it to the moderator to see how we do that. Uh, I would like to specially thank our session partner, Access Assist, for facilitating and curating the session. Without any delay, I want to hand hand it over to Radhika Agashe, Executive Director, Access Assist, to take this forward. Thank you so much, Radhika. Over to you. Thank you, Srinath. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us at this very important session on uh, legal and regulatory barriers to adoption of digital financial services at the 12th Global uh, uh, Sankalp Summit 2020. Uh, this is the first time that Access Assist, as part of its Inclusive Finance India initiative, uh, is partnering with Sankal, and we are really incredibly excited about hosting uh, this panel uh, in partnership with uh, Sankal. Um, RBI reports that the total digital wallet transactions uh, in India nearly doubled uh, in May 2020 to uh, rupees 250 crores compared to February. And this indicates a significant uh, potential and a rising popularity of digital financial services uh, in India, obviously, particularly course in the current pandemic situation. Uh, however, challenges related to uh, the entry barriers for suppliers reaching the last mile, lack of regulatory clarity, and its impact on innovation uh, for you know to continue um, uh, to affect the healthy ecosystem uh, growth. Uh, this panel uh, discussion will hopefully provide us with some solutions in overcoming these challenges and in making digital financial services accessible to the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, we have an excellent panel uh, lineup composed of a former regulator, a practitioner, a researcher, and a lawyer. It's my privilege to introduce our moderator, Mr. Vijay Chuk, consultant payment solutions, uh, regulation and oversight. Uh, he was with the RBI for uh, over 30 years. Uh, he will be joined by Anand Bajaj, founder of Pay Nearby, Aparajata uh, Shrivastav, partner at Ikigai Law, Shrikar Prasad, policy analyst, Future of Finance Initiative at Dwara Research. On behalf of Sankalp and Inclusive Finance India, I welcome the speakers and thank them for agreeing to our request to join this discussion today. And without further ado, I now hand over the session to the moderator. Over to you, Vijay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Radhika, for the nice introduction. Uh, my name is Vijay Chuk. Uh, the topic uh, is uh, extremely provocative for an ex-regulator. Hopefully, uh, I will be able to play uh, a defendant's uh, advocate in this process, and you'll permit me to uh, challenge your findings on the ground and to the mindset of the regulator itself. Yeah. Uh, before I begin, uh, I would like to welcome uh, all the participants those I can see and those I wish I could see. But uh, in current times, uh, this is how it goes. And so let's proceed with this uh, session. In the beginning, I would like to lay out what is the Indian contextual background. All of you are aware of it, of course. We have in India a massive kind of a setup and a massive requirement. We have over 1.3 billion people living across over 650, 700,000 villages and townships. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of banks across commercial, cooperative, uh, and other structure. We have introduced and supplemented this banking structure with uh, over 50 PPI players and a huge BC network. Notwithstanding such a huge input that has been put in the last 35, 40 years, we still lag behind in various parameters in terms of uh, financial services and access to it. Yeah. I will spell those things issues later on. The current issue is the GDP uh, ratio for cash is continues to be extremely high. 
And today we are going to find out why digital finance has not been able to penetrate the cash segment to the extent that it was desirable. So having said this, let me move on to how we as regulators see our role. Uh, when you said barriers to regulatory, uh, regulatory barriers to financial services, the first thing I, happens to me is I get a little startled because right across my uh, years in, as a regulator, I always felt we were more as enablers, enablers of the system and as protectors of customer interest. We are also uh, invested, uh, as you are aware, uh, as the Reserve Bank of India, we have invested large amount of money in digitization efforts. We introduced, I think way back in the 1980s, the check, uh, uh, comp computers for ch check clearing systems. Then we moved on to MICA. We moved on to electronic funds transfer. We set up an RTGS system, an EFT. And so many, we set up a domain itself on which it rides the entire network. So over the years, Reserve Bank has been taking a lead role in enabling payment systems. Yeah. Uh, we have also been extremely transparent as far as uh, our vision is concerned. We share our vision documents with the public. We put on website all the instruction that we issue. We interface with all the stakeholders constantly. We also carry out financial literacy and public awareness programs like uh, RBI Kathaya campaigns, which uh, all of you are extremely familiar with. Uh, beyond that, the uh, structure which was to grow and the initiative was to come from various stakeholders. We were trying to create a scenario of what we called a safe, secure and efficient payment system. So it was called S2E. Subsequently, we supplemented that safe, secure, efficient with something more, which we call the 7A framework in 2012. The first A talks about accessibility. So we want uh, access to be given easily to the consumer and the customers. It should also be affordable. And there should be an assurance that the transaction will take place. Then it should be available. From possibly the 24x7 efforts that we are doing for NEFT and RTGS is that one single step. ATM was another step, but the main thing is the NEFT RTGS coming in uh, on a 24x7, uh, 24x7 basis is going to be the next step. We also felt that payment services uh, should be appropriate, appropriate to the consumer. There should be no exploitation also. And we also felt that uh, through literacy and awareness programs, people should be aware of what they are doing, how much they are paying, and how much will be the cost. And so therefore, based on all this, we said the seventh A would be that of accept, accept, acceptability. We wanted that the payment, digital payment system should be willingly embraced by the population as such. And it should not be sort of uh, forced down their throats yet. So over the years, uh, since 2012, as you are aware, we have been uh, uh, leashing out various, various products into the market. Uh, we laid out PPI framework for uh, enabling small value transactions uh, and people with low, uh, people who could not afford to have accounts in banks to set it up. We also laid out a UPI faster payment framework, which is now world famous. And today itself in the news you would have raised that we have hit 2 billion transactions in just October itself, which is a massive kind of a growth considering it's just been in operation for two to three years. This level of growth is unprecedented in the digital world. We also laid out digital guide, lender guidelines, put P2P lending platforms. We had PAPG guidelines. We had the Bharat bill payment system. We had trades to cater to MSE, SME sector. We brought in payments banks, small finance banks. We enabled the KYC process uh, on an e-KYC process, but after the Supreme Court judgment, we moved it on to a digital and a video KC uh, system. And uh, uh, intervention and pricing also was done by making zero MDR uh, and free 24X7 NEFT. We also ensured that the customer has a very limited liability or if not a zero liability uh, in the process. So having said all this, 
I feel uh, you guys are on the ground uh, at three levels. So uh, Aprajita is uh, uh, and Sh Shirkara and Anand are either on the ground or into research, meeting the ground level people. And therefore, they will obviously have a better eye view of what the regulator has been doing and what really needs to be done in the years forward that we can really reach out uh, to the poorest of the poor and provide a digital platform that is the world's number one. Uh, with that, I will uh, move on to the next slide, uh, which is the text that we have created. Radhika, the consumer trust. Can you see the slide? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So consumer trust in digital financial services, so many aspects have been brought about here. Yeah. So notwithstanding the above measures by the regulator, do you think there is a low level of consumer trust in digital financial services? What are those regulatory changes that can be made to build consumer trust? What can providers do to build further uh, the consumer trust aspect of it? With these three lead questions, I will uh, ask Shrikara to take on. And then, of course, the rest of the panelists can join in as and when they feel like uh, intervening in the process. So with this, Shrikara, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, before I start, I just want to make sure that I am clear and audible. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Yes, we can all hear you. Thank you. So uh, to answer if there is a low level of consumer trust in digital financial services, I would say uh, definitely. So when consumers pay in cash, the transaction is pretty straightforward. The, the transaction is tangible, so to say. There's a vendor, there's uh, cash, there's paperwork and the product, and it's all hand-to-hand -hand exchange. But um, that's not really the case in digital services where almost all the steps seem to be in thin air from a consumer perspective. So trust becomes key for consumers' engagement in uh, digital services. But there are a bunch of factors that can create a low trust environment. And um, in today's session, I'd like to take up two of those factors. Uh, the first one is uh, bad experiences. And the second one is uh, unreliable redress. Um, to start off with bad experiences, um, we all know that there is a fear among consumers that transferring money online or storing money online, so to say, uh, can be harmful. This could be because of frauds or because of other ways that consumers have lost money or simply because they don't fully understand how the process works. Um, and there are other factors like this that come in. There's also a fear that personal data that consumers share online could be misused or uh, transferred further to other third parties um, without their consent. Now, these are harms that consumers read about or hear about in the media or from their peers. And these are some uh, harms that are even reflected in annual RBI documents, uh, National Crime Record Bureau reports, and so forth. Um, but on that note, as uh, uh, Mr. Chuk was highlighting earlier, some recent RBI measures like uh, limiting consumers' liability in terms of unauthorized transactions or uh, ensuring merchant on board, merchants are onboarded only after uh, they, they, they have been verified thoroughly. These are measures that could make a difference to consumers' perception. Now, allied to these um, fears of risk and harm is uh, our experiences of friction in digital transactions. Uh, when I say friction, I mean instances where transactions fail or when, uh, when consumers don't have access to cash when they need it or when they have to pay excess commissions in accessing payment services at the last mile and so on. Um, we saw some of this happen during the recent COVID-19 lockdown when the use of the Aadhaar enabled payment system kind of went up uh, because consumers were not able to go personally to a bank uh, to withdraw their money. Uh, they had to rely mostly on AEPS, but unfortunately we noticed that there were an alarming number of transaction failures that, uh, uh, that you know, simultaneously went with the rise in use. A study we did suggested that on average, about 39% of uh, transactions failed for different reasons. And um, looking at how the figures were somewhere in the millions for APS, that's a pretty huge number. 
Now, these are the kinds of incidents that can make consumers doubt the reliability of digital financial services. Um, so when instances like these happen, where can consumers go to, where can consumers go when they have bad experiences? And that's the question with which I'd like to go to my second point, which is uh, uh, unreliable redress. Now, uh, we all know that redress is a very important lever in consumer protection and in gaining consumer trust. But consumers could, could find the current redress system quite burdensome, quite unreliable, very bluntly put. Uh, so the current system, how it's designed, it needs consumers to have a very a fair understanding of how digital processes work and how the digital supply chain is placed. Um, for example, if there's a payments grievance right now, from a consumer point of view, um, I can personally approach a payment service provider, the app I use for, uh, the provider of the app I use for making payments. I can approach my bank, the police, the digital ombudsman, the banking ombudsman, uh, the civil courts, the consumer courts, and there are a couple of other forums, but strictly from a legal point of view, there's only one right forum that I can approach first, depending on what the issue is, what the grievance itself is. And um, all other forums can reject my complaints straight away. Um, for instance, the banking ombudsman kind of rejected 14% of all uh, complaints made to it in 2018-19 based solely on this ground that it wasn't the right forum to approach at the first instance. Um, to add to this, the kind of documentation and evidence standards that are expected from consumers, uh, they are very high for a consumer to meet without having that understanding of the system. And most redress forums right now seem to be located in uh, metropolitan areas um, and that, that are far away for a last mile consumer, even from a, say a peri-urban area to reach. Um, and these problems are all adding to the existing rooted notions in consumers' mind that you know redress and legal proceedings can be slow and costly. Um, in such a system, which, I mean, first off, the system shouldn't expect consumers to identify the problem, identify uh, the right entity, and then find, you know, uh, find proof of, uh, for their claims in a very digital process that they, uh, that they may not understand at all. That's too much of an ask for consumers. Now, together, these two factors that I've discussed, uh, bad experiences and um, uh, unreliable redress, they kind of lead to one question in the consumer's mind. And that is, is it just better if I keep my money in my pocket, which I trust, which is there with me at all points. And this question is definitely more relevant for last mile low income consumers whose exposure to digital services and formal financial services are fairly limited and who have more to lose from bad experiences and uh, lack of reliable redress. Now with this backdrop, what can regulators and providers do? Um, I have about five points that I'd like to discuss, so uh, please do bear with. Uh, the first point straightforward is something for both providers and regulators is to design suitable services to match consumer needs, consumer capabilities, and mental models. Now there are many factors that make digital services inaccessible and kind of strange for consumers, for low-income consumers. Um, now, providers and regulator, how, how providers and regulators can um, tackle this problem is by co-creating services with consumers based on their requirements and capabilities. Now, at the last mile, what this could mean is um, having solutions for low technology environments, that uh, technology that can work offline, um, having robust cash and cash out networks that help consumers move between cash and digital as they please, um, having assisted digital models that can help consumers with less exposure to digital interfaces, less literacy, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, um, and then having language and culture sensitive services uh, where you know consumers of all languages feel comfortable using a digital interface. Uh, 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 or uh, say it, people can uh, overcome cultural barriers that say are created by gender uh, to use digital services. And lastly, maybe having a credible entity in place that consumers can interact with uh, in payment services or financial services to which can help in increasing trust. Uh, the second measure I can think of is reducing the burden on consumers as much as possible. 
this could actually be like the RBI's um, uh, uh, direction on limiting consumers' liability in, um, un in when unauthorized transactions take place. Um, similarly, if redress could be triggered automatically or with minimal effort from consumers when there is a transaction failure or an unauthorized transaction, it could bolster consumer trust in uh, uh, digital financial services. Now, the RBI recently in August came out with the online dispute redress uh, guidelines, and they look like they can bring about some meaningful changes in redress, but it would be interesting to see how much more effective and accessible uh, these guidelines make a redress for uh, consumers. The third point that I can think of is to definitely provide data protection safeguards. There is strong evidence now that all consumer segments value uh, the safety of their personal data. And one straight way to improve trust in digital services is to show that consumers' personal data is protected by law. Uh, the personal data protection bill could achieve this um, however, it's really important to note here that once the data protection bill is passed into law, uh, we might see a lot of disturbance in the financial sector. Our analysis shows that financial sector regulators might have to revise a lot of uh, personal data related regulations, like say the KYC directions, to comply with this new data protection regime. And this process can be quite disruptive for both providers and for consumers. So, it is important for providers and regulators now to proactively understand and then uh, work towards aligning data protection safeguards that can eventually provide a robust data protection system for consumers. Um, the uh, fourth and second last point that I have, um, so I'm conscious of time, is uh, to ensure that existing consumer protection measures are enforced properly at the last mile. Um, in my personal experience, as well as experiences I've seen on ground, how well existing measures are enforced at the last mile is a matter of debate. Uh, and I think regulators and providers both need to take a step to ensure that um, existing regulations are enforced properly at the last mile and that uh, the last mile entities comply with these um, regulations. It could be through strict monitoring activities at the last mile. It could be through relying on feedback loops from the consumers at the last mile. And it could also mean increasing employee and consumer awareness. But uh, this is a very important step towards gaining trust. And lastly, um, just to uh, audit and upgrade technical systems regularly. I think uh, taking proactively detecting where, te uh, where technologies are falling short or where technical capacity is falling short is really important uh, to reduce friction for consumers, so to say. So to conclude, I'll say that all measures taken to boost financial services may fall short if they do not gain consumers' trust. Um, back to you, sir. So th thank you, Shrika. Uh, I think most of the issues that you've uh, laid out, those are uh, works in progress. And a lot of steps have already been taken. And I'm sure we are going to see some of those aspects coming into play uh, in the near future. Literacy, from a literacy perspective, uh, Reserve Bank has been trying to introduce banking as a subject in school uh, uh, exams, in, in the school level. I think that should go a long way. The other aspects which you raised about data uh, and other things, I think uh, Aparajita will be taking it up in the next slide. So I'll request Radhika to show us the next slide of questions so that uh, the viewers uh, can see uh Sir, may I, uh, with your permission, yeah. intervene and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, some points that uh, Shikara has mentioned beautifully. Sure. Um, sure. I would also uh, submit here uh, in the same breath that uh, while 39% of the transactions in AEPS fail uh, mm -hmm. due to lack of infrastructure connectivity at the last mile, but 92% of the customers get serviced. Yeah. And uh, like you said, six and a half lakh villages with only 25,000 ATMs, what yeah. choice does the poor man have but to try again? So yeah. uh, uh, there is an attempt endeavor uh, already laid by Reserve Bank and uh, NPCI and, yeah. and the finance ministry and uh, good people uh, meaning well to work well in yeah. the ecosystem. The yeah. uh, ombudsman grants, while uh, Shikara said 14% have been rejected, you will be surprised to see at times it is so high-headed and one-sided that they don't even listen uh, 
uh, to the ground realities and the contracts uh, sorry the penalties are awarded without uh, hearing uh, uh, to the other side and which is where i want to actually ask also to do some work we should all that well there is a fraud tracking and fraud reporting uh, is there a greed tracking and greed reporting because most of the people who fall prey to the fraud are because of greed and uh, uh, someone has to do something about that and that said thankfully in digital era everything can be tracked to the last mile last dot last person sitting in noida in delhi or in mumbai in wherever uh, that where has the money moved so those uh, uh, levers should also be harnessed to go and oh, anand anand uh, let me just share this with you sir if the current regulation weighs heavily in favor of the consumer it's because the consumer is seen as a man of small means and you as an entity which faces the strictness of the ombudsman has has the capacity to bear it and of course voice it so which is what you are doing and which is what's going to happen so i think all of us need to understand that over a period of time things are going to get better and i've seen these developments right from the first electronic uh, transfers which started now to current levels i think we have moved ahead and we have come a long way uh, but as i said we unfortunately we are limited by time and to play the uh, defendants advocate i would need another one one hour <laughs> long with all of you to <laughs> fully to agree, sir. Fully agree. various aspects which you have uh, so very nicely raised and yeah. i really uh, appreciate uh, shri kara's research inputs which have come forward and all these inputs are actually taken on board with the reserve bank and the committees which have been set up and anand is very much aware because he is part of some of those very proactive committees and they are under study they are works in progress and i'm sure we are going to see better days ahead so with that uh, we move on to aprajita who will also cover some of the aspect that shrikara has raised particularly regarding uh, data protection and things but on a macro level basis my question is going to revolve around these three four aspects which we have put on the screen for all the viewers to see and then i will just initiate the question so it's about adoption of digital payments and constraints so you talked about uh, connectivity issues and the need for a product which works on low technology all these things are directions not of last 2 3 years but they are there since 2012 uh, 15 vision statements yeah. where we wanted to do offline transactions so we allowed an sms based uh, system didn't work too well we uh, ussd was introduced didn't work too well the aps was introduced had problems with the big machines and things and uh, anand has taken that to the next uh, level where the technology has improved so i think we are getting there we are not getting there with the pace we would all like to do but i think you'll have to bear and probably Uh, you guys also have to take some uh, better initiatives on some of those aspects but let me just uh, open this chapter to uh, aprajita who's uh, an expert on legal issues and uh, so uh, do you see what are these kind of things which are happening competition is it uh, uh, too is it too open is it uh, competition a very difficult thing is access not available as you said ki the are the consumers not able to access payment worlds or even for redressal of their issues and what about the yeah. innovation sandbox his sandbox put limitations yeah in a sense uh, there mm. are many things which we have played out the nue being the latest the papg guidelines being another one so all of them have certain aspects which are uh, worth worthy of discussion in this session so i will leave it to you to give us a feedback on what's the public which approaches you for advice asking Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. I think Shri Kara raised some really interesting points. And before I get to what uh, Sir had mentioned about in the in the slide itself, um, just anecdotally, I wanted to speak about the chargeback process. So I used to work for a payment aggregator, and payment aggregators have very, very onerous uh, clauses always in their agreements about chargeback. Um, their simple petition to the merchant is: Look, the acquiring bank, the nodal bank, has very strict agreements with me. about chargebacks i am taking open liability on behalf of a merchant so for instance a merchant promises to deliver cell phones 
or any other product and doesn't keep up to its promise, there are massive chargeback risks that a payment aggregator is taking on behalf of a merchant. So the payment aggregator says that I'm not on, I'm not just facilitating payments through digital means, giving you a bouquet of digital payment options. I'm also acting as an entity which hedges risk, which monitors risk of the entire payment transaction network. Therefore, I have to keep very, very open ended chargeback provisions in my agreements, which say if there's a chargeback, if it's successful, we should be able to block your settlement amount. Now, um, anecdotally, once I actually instituted a chargeback against uh, a fraudulent merchant, I had made a purchase, the product wasn't delivered to me. I instituted a chargeback with my payment aggregator. Payment aggregator obviously um, uh, sent me to the issuing bank. Uh, over the course of three months, I must have written about 20 mails to test out the process. It was a small amount, but I wanted to see the process. Um, I was directed from one department to the other department and, and many mails were exchanged. I tried to explain my point of view that unlike a cash transaction or digital transaction the gives me the consumer a certain amount of trust a certain amount of um, confidence that if the merchant fails to deliver i can raise a charge back the process was so cumbersome it was uh, you know uh, it was just a process of going from one department to the other within the bank itself within the aggregator itself that ultimately after a couple of months i i let it go what that showed to me as a consumer before I wear my legal hat or before I even go to the industry's point of view, what that showed to me as a consumer is that uh, before I even go to regulatory redress, I should be able to have simple redress from the payment system provider itself. The person who gave me the service for the digital payment system should be able to redress my chargeback dispute with the merchant in a simple and easy to understand manner. As a payments lawyer, I was still not able to get proper answers for where does my chargeback resolution, where does my chargeback dispute um, get settled? Do I approach the payment aggregator? Do I approach the acquiring bank? Do I approach my issuing bank? If so, what is my resolution? Uh, so I think before we even get to what the regulator can do, which is very important, we should also sort of uh, try to understand our own rights with the payment system system operator. And just very quickly before I get to uh, before I get to the point on the adoption by customers of digital payments and the constraints for that, I really want to give an example of where there's a balance between customer con convenience and customer security. So back in the day when uh, additional factor authentication and OTP was introduced for every card not present transactions. I'm sure a lot of payments players would have said one more layer for customers to drop off. What happens if I don't have cell phone network? Look at the amount of friction it's adding to a transaction. If a customer is consenting uh, to uh, have no second factor authentication, why does the regulator need to come in between? And obviously a layer of friction means that it's one more step for a customer to jump through to say, yes, I want to pay for this item. That counterintuitively actually spiked trust in e-com transactions because it said two things to the customer. Um, the card won't be misused because every time I need to approve a card transaction, OTP will come through. And uh, the other thing that it did is it increased the customer's trust in e-com transactions in general. Um, it allowed the customer to freely use, sorry, Sorry, Shika, I'll just, just get to that. It allowed the customer to freely use her card so that she can trust the fact that if I pay now, I'll get a, I'll definitely get a product later delivered by the merchant on the e-com platform. So just two things I wanted to add to add to the consumer trust aspect that Shikara was speaking of. Okay. Now I come to um, uh, the, the main slide on adoption of digital payments. And before I get to each of the points given on the slide, I think I'll just zoom out a little to speak about revenue models in the digital payment industry and how they're going to change over time. Um, <clears throat> so we've all seen how introduction of KYC, mandatory KYC, for uh, e-wallets and how that impacted the e-wallet industry, especially for full KYC e-wallets where peer-to-peer -peer transactions are permitted, where I can send 10 rupees to Shrikara, where I, it's not just my, my balance in my PPI is not just used to make person to merchant transactions, which is a massive use case for, um, uh, for e-wallet players, especially for small ticket transactions. 
and often peer to peer payments were being used to actually pay, pay merchants i can go and pay my sabzi wala 20 23 rupees uh, through an e wallet transaction i'm sorry sir you're on mute so, sorry sorry sir sorry i just want to interrupt you for a second uh, want to request uh, people who are participating in the disc uh, discussions today to post their questions in the chat box thank you please carry on sorry no problem sir no problem okay so i'm just using e wallets as sort of a example to show how kyc the cost of kyc the friction that kyc brings can in some ways disrupt a a, a, a digital payments products revenue model now um in any case most digital payments products run on very very thin margins mdr is uh, even without the regulatory cap on certain um, uh, digital payment options like bheem mdr is any way uh, getting compressed by market forces because payments products are extremely commoditized one may be slightly better than the other but they are there's nothing there's nothing proprietary about a payments product so it's commoditized the market forces can bring it down to zero on top of that when there are kyc costs which are very high um if if the regulator says no look i need in person verification for you to be able to check the authenticity of a customer even if the wallet transaction peer to peer wallet transaction is for 10 rupees um i need you to be able to have uh, a live person at the back of a video kyc uh to be able to conduct a check that the, is this a real customer or is this a spoof of a customer's video which is just uploaded to conduct the video kyc all of this does add to the cost and of course the friction of doing video kyc and in person kyc to check a physical person going to you and checking your documents in paper and looking at you and saying yes this is a prajita now when you have high kyc costs and friction when you have low mdr models or zero mdr models in certain uh, digital payments product what that does is it leads to the smaller payments players not being able to offer sashayized products not being able to acquire a a um a customer who does not want a massive value uh, who does not have large payment transactions that she's interested in for a smaller merchant to to in for an acquirer to invest in acquiring a smaller merchant it becomes unviable when the revenue and the cost is 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 not in sync with a long term revenue model for the payments player this means that a lot of payments players will look at payments itself their payments business itself as the customer acquisition cost let me acquire the customer by offering her a payments product let me aggregate payments data over several number of months or years so that i can use her payments data whether she is a merchant or she is a customer to then cross sell a more lucrative product say a lending product this obviously has its downsides um as is clearly seen by the paytm model where they try to upsell lending products to their merchants by underwriting them through payments data it's not easy to it's not easy to roll out the npas can spike if you just have payments data to underwrite a merchant for loan product but more importantly a business model which depends on data to cross sell payments data to cross sell another more lucrative product might get disrupted by the personal data protection bill one of the fundamental premise of the personal data protection bill when it comes in is purpose limitation if you take my data for a particular purpose don't use it for another purpose so if you've taken my data to process a payments transaction without my explicit consent because of course payments data is sensitive personal information and explicit consent yes no is needed for you to use my data for some other purpose it will become very difficult for payments players to then say i'll keep um, having a negative revenue model uh, for payments business to acquire my customers and then at a later date at one uh, sort of point i'm going to switch on another product a mutual fund product a lending product an insurance product which might give me a sustained revenue stream this does two things one it there is certainly a risk of profiling customers that a prajita you know has this kind of a payment history so let me underwrite her for a, a better loan product a better insurance product two it will get completely disrupted once the pdp comes in uh and three it also leads to 
um payment companies saying that unless we scale unless we are a dominant player in the market there is no point in doing a payments business because data only at scale would help me underwrite customers so caps like 33% upi caps on transactions etc i don't know how far they will how far they will work in the industry because the industry itself is becoming designed to have a few big players take the chunk of the take the chunk of the customer pie when you have sort of kyc costs spike up when we had kyc costs okay, uh, mandatory kyc in, in, uh, introduced for ppis it benefits or rather i would say big players are able to take that shock paytm is able to dip into its its um, you know reservoirs uh, uh, of massive amount of funding to be able to do in person verification ola for instance is able to tap into the fact that your driver meets you every time you have to go for a ride so ola the driver can conduct kyc for you through an in person verification certain players through their business model or through their deep pockets are able to um uh, are able to comply again leading to a, a, a dominant player concentration list again leaving out the smaller players who may have more innovative competitive products i'll pause here i'm, I'm very conscious of the time although there's lots more to discuss i don't want to eat into anand's time on on his on his presentation no, no, no. as well no, no, you so are... i think uh, you were very very clear anybody would like to add anand you want to say something before no, no, you begin on the brilliant uh, what aparajita said is awesome uh, just in continuation with shikara said uh, it sounds like at times the regulations are made for only rich uh, and funded companies and so that anyone else cannot uh, and uh, like the technologies are built for people who can tweet yeah uh, the failure less failure in upi Uh, probably respects the fact that the customers tweet, but my poor men whom we serve, the 120 million can't. So the technologies have not evolved. So yeah. even what uh, Prajita is saying that the regulations are actually lopsided and made uh, in such a manner that only funded large startups companies, so to say, can. Very very well said. Okay, so I think uh, to sum up what she said, she's talked about AFA and KYC as creating friction. as i said both are actually to enhance trust uh, you want to say something shri kala before yes sir just to add to aprajita's okay. points it very well taken on uh, the you know it's unclear what the unit economics of the whole payment system uh, payments ecosystem are right now and without that uh, i think the regulations that are coming out now including the nue framework it's unclear if that's the right policy or a regulatory lever to pull to address the competition aspects which um with uh you know affecting the system right now and just to very clearly very narrowly sum up two points one is um if you look at the nua framework it looks like if you look at the scope of activities a lot of those activities are covered under existing guidelines from the rpi existing directions like for white label atms and so on so i think what would happen with the nua is there could be double regulation or maybe a regulatory arbitrage so that's one thing to look out for and second the nua framework does not really say anything about interoperability between payment systems so would that mean you're just going to have multiple payment systems trying to corner for market share and crowding out the rest is a risk that we need to look at and just on the kyc point i wanted to ask um actually talk about the central kyc system which was meant to address uh, customer acquisition costs etc so uh, why couldn't it take off and um, why the rbi couldn't kind of follow up with a system like the kras in sedi is probably one thing we should look at as well. yeah so i agree uh, so as i said uh, the rbi intervenes and everything doesn't happen the way uh, they assume it is going to happen so many times if you see when the ppis were introduced the requirement for the innovators so to say was very low but out of all the players who came in in the first wave of innovations they were not able to go beyond a point because uh, if you don't didn't have the uh, financing or something you just didn't move so something happened in 2014 when paytm came as a ppi and that actually changed the scenario in favor of larger organizations to be able to take the hit to really spread so what was happening was the pace with which people with uh, low finances but extremely good ideas move is like crossing the river on pebble stones you walk very slowly 
and therefore everybody says what is the regulator done and what is it achieved so we are quite wary of all these things over a period of time we always go from phase 1 to phase 2 so right now we are in phase 2 where we are looking at larger players so that the speed with which financial inclusion and the adoption takes place is much uh, faster than that so i think uh, something about chargebacks and other things is there within the banking system the reserve bank is extremely sensitive to ensuring that there is a mechanism in place if i if you see some of the other things which happen in the other sectors other than finance you won't even know who to go to at least here you know that you have a series of options to go to whether the redressal is done in time or delayed uh, is another issue that we need to tackle but i know of a case where for a for 500 rupees less received from the atm because the bank delayed and the penalty is 100 rupees per day the institution ended up paying more than 40 50000 rupees for a 2 4 500 rupee uh, shortfall in the uh, in the atm uh, uh, release of the money yeah. so there are cases which happen like this ombudsman i, I quite agree they tend to take a macro level perspective on uh, how they are rejecting and sometimes they give an advice of what needs to be done at the ground level so some of these things have taken place uh, options are being given uh, the zero liability issue is one thing which has been building up uh, low technology is being encouraged so i think over a period of time we will have uh, better and better improvements so some of some of you can uh, address those feedbacks to the regulator and i'm sure Uh, and through various committees they are being communicated i think they are taking a lot of steps but having said this i cannot uh, ex- you should not expect a regulator to create a business model for you which works the way you want for you from the consumer perspective as well as from other when you apply for a license the rules and uh, groundwork is uh, made out you create a business plan get that business plan approved from the reserve bank and then you find that you are not able to achieve 10% of your business plan 10% i can imagine the rules being uh, ridiculous if you are saying ki i reached 50 and i still need some loosening up yeah but if you achieve 10% then it also talks about your capacity and your ability and your product and so you can say i have an extremely brilliant idea but why doesn't it get adopted why doesn't somebody come and finance you so all these things i think are issues that we will all uh, understand over the next few years and then uh, i think uh, aprajita has very clearly laid out the specific issues that are facing in the adoption process i totally agree with you in, in that sense here there are constraints we all admit reserve bank admits other regulators admit data privacy is one major issue which is still to uh, open up all the possibilities of the friction that it will create KYC as a low cost thing reserve bank was very happy with the e KYC process but unfortunately courts had a different view and we went in for that more expensive product of uh, digital uh, verification but i think over the next one year we might see some more evolution taking place in that aspect also also the ckyc uh, product has to be developed there's no doubt about that so i think with those words uh, let's move out to a very very crucial segment and i uh, believe we have to keep 10 minutes for the questions and then again i think some of these uh, things which you have uh, spelt out so very distinctly will come from the public the public uh, the watch people who are watching us today they will ask those query questions so i don't want to spend too much time on this we move on to the next topic radhika can we move to the next set of uh, questions yeah okay fine so this uh, is the last set of questions which we are covering at the bottom end of it as i said for years we have been trying to help the rural people become bankable or at least have abilities to get uh, services of financial finan- get uh, access to financial services so this is the larger bigger position that we have so some of these issues and pin pricks we are feeling at the urban level at a very high ratio as you say uh, something which i think we should be able to bear and be able to carry on 
at the bottom end of it is extremely important that people who are actually doing something for the last mile whether it's an offline payment model it's an aadhar enabled payment model how is this being taken forward there was a committee which was set up which is called the cddp recommendations anand's been associated with it and we have uh, the good fortune of having him here itself and who better than to talk about the cddp recommendations and what ails the financial inclusion efforts from both from a regulatory and legal aspect uh, uh, this thing uh, anand uh, please carry on Uh, thank you, uh, sir. And uh, uh, to the problems, I would uh, only quote Galib, uh, uh, where somewhere he has said something, something like, "Mushkilen itni bad gayi Galib ki asan ho gayi." Bilkul. <laughs> yeah. And the sector is marred with, uh, I think, policy dilemmas so much so that saans le ya chode ye samaj me nahi aa raha. Paisa kamaye ya gawaye ye samaj me nahi aa raha. MDR kamane ki chiz hai ya. नेशन बिल्डिंग में समर्पित हो जाने की चीज है ये समझ में नहीं आ रहा नाउ आई वुड फर्स्ट पिक अप फोर रिकमेंडेशंस बिकॉज़ रेंटिंग इज वेरी इजी बट इफ आई गो टू डायरेक्टली एंड आई वुड इल्यूट टू आल्सो द सीडीटीपी रिकमेंडेशंस अबाउट बीसी वायबिलिटी ऑन अ फाइव सो टू कनेक्ट टू योर डेटा ऑफ सिक्स लाख विलेजेस एंड ओनली ट्वेंटी फाइव थाउजेंड रेलिवेंट ए टी एम्स टू दीज सिक्स लाख विलेजेस बहुत ना इंसाफी है the distribution is totally lopsided is skewed towards urban center and over bank over uh, digitized segment uh, where we say it is digital savvy greedy segment who would switch loyalty after loyalty after loyalty just because of cashback on various payment modules but for those 6 lakh villages if one has to reach out financial services imagine what a bc agent gets for dispensing 500 rupee 2 rupees whereas if he sells soaps and oil and grains he gets a uh, 40 rupees minimum a 8% margin on that how does and uh, when he says that uh, vc viability of at least 1% fee should be given why are we running short and shy of it fact that the chief economic advisor has been talking about 1.28 lakh crore remains unaccessed in dbt accounts doesn't it behove that we go down to that path and allow if not a 70000 rupee costing per month costing atm which is not viable in rural to give a little fee to the bc agent to go and do the rashtra hit mein samarpit wala kaam ki if not mdr do paise to kamaye wo meaningfully and what uh, strikara said with failures galore and ombudsman fire the easiest thing that a customer does is picks up a stone and beats the hell out of the uh, bc agent in the rural वो किसके पास जाए शिकायत करने सो so, एक अगर वायबल एनवायरमेंट हो तो सही टेक्नोलॉजी इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर पीपल कैन ब्रिंग सेकंड टू ऑल द लिटरेट पीपल हियर व्हाट इज द जीएसटी इन द कंट्री ऑन फाइनेंशियल सर्विसेज वन वुड से 18 परसेंट बट द पुअर मैन दैट वी सर्व वी एंड अप स्पेंडिंग 27 परसेंट ऑन जीएसटी दिस इज नॉट न्यू एंड सर यू हैव रिटन ब्यूटिफुली ऑन योर स्लाइड नीति है पर आयोजन नहीं the uh, uh, segment is exempted from gst uh, uh, noting 9937 or something in the gst uh, rules uh, it says that for the accounts in rural gst is waived but uh, look at the vagaries of advancement of technology and npci has even written to the gst people that the account is in rural or urban cannot be now any more identified with core banking being centralized with single ifsc code being used it is no more a ifsc code of khagadia bihar that i can know that it is a rural or urban when i am remitting money from urban to a rural that niti is not uh, uh, implementable so the cost the banks unfortunately levy back the 9% extra uh, uh, shortfall that they have after 50% input credit is levied on the bcs yeah uh, 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 in the right spirit that as if we make lot of money Uh, there is enough pressure on mdr uh, from the government there is enough pressure on bc services uh, through the uh, uh, gst lacuna that exists third we are not in a shakespearean english uh, uh, regulation framework where the definition of a uh, and any needs to be explained hear me out section 194 and proviso 3 of income tax act today exempts the business correspondents from tds on cash withdrawal when in far rural someone has to withdraw cash from a bank and dispense to the customers 
the law says that business correspondents are exempt but the banks someone some banks have taken a view that the law says any bc of a bank a bank means of that particular bank then they will exempt otherwise if it is of any bank uh, they would not uh, handle the fact that nachiket more sorry to interrupt i think we are running out of time uh, i think uh, sir ye problem hai <laughs> ye problem hai garibon ki koi nahi sunta last mein aate but can out do ghante ka hona chahiye tha i i would leave it at that but yeah. yes uh, the intent is clear no one wants to listen to people who don't tweet uh, they talk to god directly and we are their subservient we are helping them sir no i think we uh, we will see if radhika gives us some extension on this <laughs> and then uh, we can take it forward radhika uh, would you uh, like to take in a few questions directly uh, let's go to the questions radhika Yes, yeah, can you, so, can you take? Uh, I just request Trina to. Uh... Hi, Radhika. Uh, Trina, can Radhika. we take uh, five ten questions? Uh, unfortunately, the streams are blocked, so we have to really stick to time. We have about three minutes, and the next session starts right after. Okay. So, if there are any questions, we can take them quickly in two minutes. But I will have to have a hard so, stop at twelve thirty. so maybe you can take a financial inclusion question because that's the bottom end of everything that we do sir answer karne ka time nahi hoga so let's take something that we can answer in 3 minutes with your permission but anyway then you carry on uh, and then we uh, of course uh, thank everybody for having participated but we leave it after uh, anand concludes the major point that he was trying to make please carry on नहीं आई आई वुड ओनली अगेन कोट गालिब कि जलाए थे चिराग हमने दीदार हुस्न को हमें क्या मालूम गोया रोशनी होगी या पैसा बनाने आप निकलिए जहां आप सर्विस करने निकलिए देर आर इनफ इनकम्बरेंसिस दैट विल इम्पीड दैट रीच ऑफ फाइनेंशियल इंक्लूजन टू द लास्ट माइल यू विल हैव टू सी बियॉन्ड वॉट अपराजिता वॉज सींग दैट इफ एम डी आर इनकम वॉर शर्ट वन लुक दैट लैंडिंग and which is where we have ensured at pay nearby that there are 18 line of services as a swiss knife that retailer kahin se to survive ho so yes, i yes. i would just sum up at that that don't be just looking at god almighty or the regulator for everything uh, bear your own cross and curses and be viable on your own uh, that's about it so thank you so much uh, all of uh, all the participants the panelists and the audience of course we are not able to see the audience but we hope to see them next time uh thank you shrikara for a very uh, good summation of this aspect thank you anand uh, thank you parajita i hope we can take this uh, session forward offline also and uh, carry on with some of these points that you have discussed i'd be very happy to share a deeper perspective on each of the points that you have raised here and of course uh, uh, any viewer uh, would like to carry on this discussion with any one of us is free to do it i'm sure access and radhika will uh, provide the links the phone numbers the emails to to the to those who are interested in carrying this forward so thank you so much uh, and we can conclude with this over to you radhika thank you so thank you everyone